Okay, you may be seated. Prayer for illumination. Savior God, your word is a lamp to our feet on this discipleship road. Walk with us. Guide us with your wisdom and grace. Open us to discerning your will and your way. Amen. I'm going to read from Genesis. You're going to do the responsive reading together with Pastor later. I will read this by myself. Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 to 21. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is also your offspring. Abraham rose early in the morning. He took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy, and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. And if there are any Hi, Scarlet. Hi, Violet. How are you this morning? I think it's funny that, that you two are, are here to, because I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit. I have one sister. I was the younger sister. And the story that we just read about is about, um, well, it's about a lot of different things, but I want to talk about how we get angry with one another. And I'm sure that happens on occasion, right? Between, between siblings, right? So when you're, when you're little, uh, we have to learn not to hit each other, right? Uh, when we get angry. You don't have to. I don't, I don't need to know, but I, I know from experience that um, since I, that I'll tell you, well, I'll tell this on my, on my sister, that she used to hit me until I got taller than her and my legs got longer than hers. And here's a technique. You sit on the couch and you put your legs in front of you and then her tiny little arms couldn't reach me. You're supposed to laugh at that. Right? But it took her a very, very long time, not when she got upset, to just hit. And, you know, of course, then what would I do? I would go run to my parents and go, she hit me. And then she would get in trouble. And yeah. So anyway, but the people naturally deal with their anger in different ways. Some people, um, you know, we learn, you know, we, we try, learn not to, to hit each other. But we can also hurt each other with words, Right? We can, you know, some people can just say, you know, say really awful things when they're angry. And they think because they're angry, it justifies it. 
but we're going to talk about better ways to, to express our anger. So some people like, will just erupt, but then it's over, and they're good, and they're done, because they got it out. Some people get real quiet, and, and they don't, because they don't like conflict, they don't write, so they don't say anything. And, and then some people, I say, go into the cave, right? And they think about it, and then they come back and they talk about it. In my family, the family that I grew up with, we have all of those people, right? My, my sister is the erupt and say it type, but then she's done, she's good, she said it, she's fine. Uh, my, my folks tend to be the, the I could, they stuff it, they stuff their anger, they don't, because they don't like conflict, but eventually, you know what happens? I, if I look at the adults, <laughs> You stuff it down so much, and then you get resentful about it, and then finally, like, all comes out in one mismatched, you always, nah, 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 right? I tend to be the cave type. I go, and I think about it, and, you know, and then I calm myself down, and then I come out, and then I try to talk about it. Um, but it's, it's um, but I have somebody in my family who doesn't, one of my kids said to me, I don't like that you do that because you've got it all thought out and there's no way to argue with you once you've, you know, and, but it's really funny. But there are healthy ways. We, getting angry with one another, it's, it happens all the time because that's, because that's what it is. Because I want this and you want that and we have to come to some agreement or, you know, you had, I wanted, whatever. We get angry with each other. It's normal. But learning how to deal with it in a way that don't hurt each other, that's part of life too. Right. So I want to say, you know, it's, it's a, you know, for the folks who want to, we have to teach ourselves to try to not only not hit each other, but not to hurt each other with our words. And, and, and I also say, I always say this with, with when I'm talking with couples who want to get married, you know, the more that you uh, deal with your conflicts, the more confidence you will have that you're able to do it as you move forward. So it's learning to talk about it. But here's the key, to remember that everything that comes out of your mouth should be said with love or from a space of love. Even if you're angry, you recognize that God loves them, that you, know, you love them. And this, my sister and I, to this day, we say we love each other no matter what. We don't always like each other, but we love each other no matter what. And that's, I think, that we need to think about with everybody. God loves this person. I need to act with them in a way that is also loving, even if we're angry with them. Is this easy? No, not at all. But it's something, and we make mistakes, and we have to ask for forgiveness, and that's all part of life. But learning how to, to, to be angry and talk about our stuff without hurting each other further, that takes a lot of work. But guess what? God is with us in it. The Spirit of God is there to help us. And hopefully you have, you know, we are here to help one another uh, learn how to do it well and, and learn how to ask for forgiveness and to give forgiveness. And it's just one of those things. In our, in our scripture passage today, we have a family that didn't necessarily deal, deal with their anger well. We're not supposed to like, say, take notes from them, but it's something that we all need to learn, right? So... Let's fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads. Dear God, um, we are so uncomfortable that, that we can get angry with each other. Help us to learn how to do it well in a way that helps us resolve our problems but doesn't inflict further injury on one another in, in all of our loving relationships. Lord, we need your help, and we thank you that, you that you promise to be with us and help us to learn and grow and be better, uh, better brothers and sisters in faith. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, and this we are going to read in unison. It is Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 through 39. Let us read together. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear for them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret 
that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge them before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So recently, I have been reading about the myth of the normal family. All of us have some dysfunction in our family, some more than others. But all of us have some wounds and or trauma inflicted upon us in our childhood, something that we have to overcome. So rather than get overly fixated on our anger that our parents were not perfect or our siblings or whomever or with whomever we were raised, we acknowledge that there is no way in creation that they could have done it perfectly because that's just not possible. And part of the human journey is creating a good life out of the mess that we were born into. Here's a gardening analogy. A seed is planted in soil and compost in order to grow. Worm poop is an asset to your soil. Poupé for the Ted Lasso fans. M. Scott Peck in his book, The Road Less Traveled, says that we must go through suffering. That's how we grow. And so rather than avoid it, we should embrace it because that's how we develop. Easier said than done. I prayed for my kids when they were little that, I, that they would know enough suffering to turn into good people, but not enough that, would, that it would break them. Not so much that it would break them. And of course, I did not want to be the cause of suffering for my own children. But surely I have made my own mistakes. So we turn to scripture to see how it's done. That's a joke. When we read about the families in scripture, in the Hebrew scriptures, we read about families that are quite dysfunctional. Cain kills Abel right off the bat. Jacob steals Esau's birthright with the help of mom who played favorites. Children conspire to kill their fathers for power, think King David. Abraham is complicit in throwing one of his sons out into the wilderness with his mother, we just read that, and then almost kills his other son. I think that's Next week's lectionary reading, Victor Peterson, I don't know what he, he might, he might preach on it or not, but all disturbing stories. We should not be taking notes from Abraham and Sarah. <laughs> She's like, this is how we do it, no, 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 no. Abraham and Sarah receive a promise from God, but then they question, they scheme. Hagar is forced to have sex with Abraham held in contempt for getting pregnant, abused by her slave owners, and thrown out of camp with her son to die. The cultural norms here are horrific. It's written by the descendants, of course, our scripture is written by the descendants of Abraham and Sarah, God's chosen people, right? 
But we also read in the story that Hagar is assured that God will make of Ishmael a great nation. Ishmael's name means God hears, and Hagar is the only person in Scripture to name God. She calls God the living one who sees me. God hears Ishmael's cries, has pity on him, and saves them, and promises to make of him a great nation. Sound familiar? Later, the Israelites will cry out to God, who hears their cries and has pity of them, and saves them from slavery in Egypt. So the Israelites will be saved from, slave, will be saved from slavery in Egypt. The Egyptians in the story are, sa- are saved from slavery by the matriarch and patriarch of the people of Israel. What are we to make of that? That we are all capable of being abuser and abused. It's important to know this about ourselves. There are times when we are righteous, and there are times when we are the opposite of that, wicked, sinful, abusive. I say this to teenagers in talking about the importance of forgiveness. Everyone at some point in their life will do something for which they will know an incredible amount of shame and will need to ask for forgiveness. And from that, we'll learn how to forgive other people and live into the grace that God has afforded all of us. So let's couch this in terms of being Christian. When in our baptism we are claimed as God's children, we are called beloved. And in our relationship with God, may known in Jesus Christ, we can know healing from the wounds inflicted by life, by our families, and by the world. And saved people save, or uh, serve, you know, or saved people serve. We are called to live lives of justice so as not to inflict pain on other folks and repentance when we are convicted that we have done so. Justice is righteousness or right living or love in action. I like the t-shirts that says justice is just love out loud. Because although no one goes unscathed in life, we try our best not to do harm. Not just in our family, but in God's family. And as we see in this story that we just read in the Old Testament, we are all children of God, Israelites and Egyptians. Whatever label we put on ourselves or on other people, we are all created by God for abundant life. So now that I've made a case for all of us being family, let's look at our gospel lesson where Jesus says, I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That last one always makes me laugh. Like, that's that hard. In this passage, Jesus is assuring the disciples that life is not going to be easy. They are going to be persecuted and killed for their faith and following Jesus. And doesn't it make you wonder, what was it about the message of Jesus that Jesus gave them to proclaim in the world that was so threatening to the powers that be that they were persecuted and killed for it? Certainly, it could not be that they were saved by grace and forgiven for their sins. Nobody's going to get killed for saying that. Jesus called the disciples to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near, that it is with us. And that had implications that threatened the status quo, that impacted people's lives and allegiances, that to breach Jesus Christ as Lord was perceived as a threat. To the state, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. My allegiance is to God before any earthly power, any nation state. My faith holds in contempt the values of the culture or the government that call me to be unfaithful to the values of my Lord and Savior. 
I will not bend a knee to Caesar or to empire's values of conquest, my people over your people, for we are all God's people. We have to be able to stand up, stand out, and stand against. Being a Christian means being countercultural. And our families may not stand with us in that. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Are we with me? We got that? But how comfortable are we calling out the government or the culture because it does not espouse the values that we have come to believe are God's values? Let me answer that for all of us. We're not comfortable at all. Not here. Maybe at home, but not here. And why is that? Because as a people of faith, we don't agree what is righteous or what is God's will. Here's some questions. Are we called to be pacifists? What is the role of men in the church? Like how I did that? Or women? Children of God of all shapes and sizes, colors and orientations. When does life begin? When does history begin? What does it mean to be good stewards of the earth? I could go on, and in earlier versions of the sermon I did. Let's admit that we are averse to being the kind of disciples that are going to make enemies of friends and neighbors and family by calling out the sins of the culture because we are choosing comfort over discord. Barbara Brown Taylor, Episcopal priest and well-known preacher, in one of her very well-known sermon, she says that in looking at what discipleship really means, she said that most of us are friends of disciples because we're not willing to embrace the sacrifice that, that true disciples were willing to embrace. And she equated people like St. Francis, Mother Teresa, Monsignor Oscar Romero, Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King Jr., Dietrich Bonhoeffer, these are disciples whom we admire, their courage and their willingness to sacrifice all for the gospel. But as friends of disciples, I want to make a case for us getting bolder in our willingness to engage the controversies of our time as a family of faith. In in a family or in any kind of group dynamic, uh, there is you, you form, you storm, and then you reform. I will never forget, I was part of a, a continuing education experience. We met twice a year for three years, and at the very last session of the small group, we had been together, we had shared, each, shared our stories with one another, we were all pastors, different denominations, different parts of the country, and this one guy at the last session erupted in fury that his expectations for this group have never been met. And he blew up at all of us and he stormed out. And I just sat there like, but this other pastor got closer to the table and he goes, all right, all right, all right. Now we're being real with each other. Now true community can form because we trust one another to get angry with each other and trust that we're gonna work it out. This is so funny because you know we've never come back together as a small group, but it can happen and it will happen and it has happened in this church. It has to have if you've been here 175 years. Where you have gotten angry with each other, you, form, you stormed, but then you reformed, you came back together. I would encourage us to be willing to engage the controversies of our time as a family of faith versus the peace at all all costs kind of family where you never talk about the thing that is ever present in the room. 
Let's be a family that is willing to talk about the real stuff of life that affects us. There are churches that don't want to talk about race when there are brothers and sisters who suffer the indignities of racism every day. Every woman that I know has a story about some sexual something that they have had to get over. And I think it's really challenging to talk about because I, you know, for a lot of men, they're like, that, those, were, those were the rules that we were told. That, that was a game that that's how you play it. We didn't know they were causing harm. Let's talk about it. Can we make space for real conversations covered in prayer, but that can usher in the kingdom of God? Can we talk about gun violence? Can we talk about depression and anxiety? How can we talk about the kingdom of God and not fight for it? Jesus said, I have come not to bring peace but a sword. How can we talk about the stuff in life that that needs to be addressed in order for the kingdom of God to be ushered in? How can we do that without throwing one another out into the wilderness or choosing the wilderness because we don't want to be made to feel uncomfortable? As a family of faith, we are dysfunctional because every family is. But out of our mess, God can create a beautiful life that fights for beauty and truth and justice and righteousness. In Jesus' name and with his help, may we be brave and may it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.